Okay. Hello, V. Welcome to the podcast. I'm so excited to have you here. I'm so excited to be here. I feel like this is long overdue. (laughs) Absolutely. This is so long overdue. I was actually able to collaborate with you on a reel recently when we're talking about side hustles. And so I love everything that you're doing to make the personal finance space inclusive. And so for folks who haven't met you before, let's talk. Who are you? Tell us who you are and what you do. Okay, I guess we'll go way back. I started my personal finance Instagram in 2016 when I found out that I couldn't pay for my student loans, my medicine, and my food. I realized I had no personal finance education. I had nothing. And so I started Instagram just to keep myself accountable, and I began paying off debt aggressively. In the beginning, I was a Dave Ramsey purist, and we can go into that. But I paid off around $50,000 with my first husband, and then I became separated, went through a divorce, lost my job. (laughs) And after all that tumultuous stuff, I ended up moving across the country to live with my now second husband. When it was all said and done, after I opened my business and got myself together, I paid off $71,000 of debt in five years. And now I am V of V Fugal Fox. And my Instagram is more of a brand and a community now than it is to hold myself accountable. So that's kind of the elevator pitch. That's incredible. So we definitely have to talk about your best strategies for paying off debt. But first and foremost, I want to dive into this because you are unapologetic. The fact that you despise Dave Ramsey, okay? Mm -hmm. And I think for a lot of folks, he is the gateway drug for personal finance because he's just done such a great fucking job of marketing himself as like the guru of gurus. So tell me a little bit about your experience into learning about him, learning about money through him. And like, what was that turning point for you that you're just like, this is fucking toxic. I need to go learn about money in a more productive way. In 2016, when I really started my Instagram, there wasn't really anybody doing it. Like, it, it's not like today. And I feel like so old and decrepit saying that. Like, <laughs> but it really wasn't. Like, there were maybe 10 to 15 accounts that were really like doing what I was doing, just holding myself accountable, trying to find any community that was doing this. Like, in real life, no one was doing this. No one was paying off debt, being frugal, saving money. Like, People that I grew up with had the same kind of education that I did and just thought I was crazy when I was like, I'm going to pay off all this debt and become debt free and then I'm going to be wealthy. People really thought I was nuts, especially my family at the beginning. So, you know, that's why I went online. I mean, I'm a millennial. I spent, you know, my teenage years coding on MySpace. So I was like, all right, well, this is what I'm going to do. There was really nobody. And so when I searched, you know, how to pay off debt, Dave Ramsey was the only person that came up. And so I got Total Money Makeover. I read it in like a day and I was hooked. And it wasn't really because of Dave himself. It was more of the stories in the book that really, really resonated with me. It it had nothing to do with Ramsey. I mean, and even now, like looking back at it, I'm like, wow, (laughs) having a budget and being frugal, what crazy ideas that is. You know, like he doesn't own those ideas. This is very simple shit. (laughs) But I was really hooked because I really, at that point in my life, um, I had just moved away from college. I had graduated college. And so I had left like this huge community of people. I didn't really have that anymore. And so I just felt like, oh my God, these people are are on my same wavelength. They want to do the same thing. Like they're talking my language. Like I'm so passionate about this. And I just fell into it. And I became like the worst version of myself. Like I was very judgmental. I was a dick online. You know, if you don't work the plan, you're a piece of shit, you know, like all this stuff. And it worked for a while. And then I realized when I got separated from my husband and I needed to buy a new car because (laughs) my old car was a 2004 Saturn Ion. It was two colors. The transmission basically fell out of it, which is why I had to get a new car. Like this car was a piece of shit. I cannot express that enough. It was barely going. By the end of it, I couldn't even go 50 miles an hour. (laughs) It was so bad. So I was like, all right, like I can either dump a bunch of money into this car. And my mechanic was like, listen, you're going to dump $1,200 into an $800 valued car. Like this is ridiculous. Don't do this. And so I ended up financing a car um, from CarMax. And I remember that day I got some flack online because of it. And it's just so funny because at that point in time, I think that was 2017 or 2018, People weren't really on this like personal finances, personal 
narrative that we are trying to um, be a catalyst in the personal finance industry now to better decisions for yourself. That wasn't really a thing. It was, you know, Dave Ramsey's plan. And I was like, listen, yeah, I know I've been telling everybody like, don't get a finance car, like don't do this. But I've realized like, this is the best thing for me. And I think that's when my gear started turning of like, this is really shitty. Like we're, we're shaming people for doing something that is the best thing for them. And it's like, it's a car. I think the interest rate was like 2.7%. Like it was, it's stupid. And then after that, 2020 happened and 2020 was just a catastrophe with Dave Ramsey. I mean, when George Floyd was murdered and the PR surrounding that and his company, and then the way he responded to COVID and the way that he responded to Rush Limbaugh passing away, it was just a clusterfuck of events. And I was like, dude, fuck this dude. (laughs) I just couldn't do it anymore. And I think I personally evolved so much in my life that like his values didn't align with my values anymore. So that's why I jumped ship. Yeah, that makes so much sense. And, you know, I think kudos to you for realizing that there was a time and place for that, but you also evolve. And I think that's the important thing when we're talking about money. It's like you don't stay in the same spot. Your belief system changes as you experience things, as you grow. And so for folks who don't know, like Dave Ramsey's whole philosophy is like debt is evil. And if you're in debt, like you're a fucking bad person. But it's also just like, how many of us have like $30,000 to just buy a car in cash? How many of us can afford to spend $100,000 on a college degree? You know, it's just like tying this debt to the fact that you've somehow become a human being that has some sort of moral deficiency is why I think there's so much shame around talking about money in personal finance, right? Because it's just like you have internalized this idea that you are somehow a bad person for making decisions with money that you were not necessarily educated to make. Dave Ramsey exploits people and exploits poor people and capitalizes on the shame and the guilt of money. And I think once I realized that I was no longer in his audience, I was no longer being marketed to because I wasn't a married, conservative, Christian, white, a marriage that looked traditional to what he markets to, I realized like it didn't make sense to me. And I also started the journey when I was 23. I was living in such a different world than what I am in now. And I was such a different person. So I just couldn't handle his inflexibility. He is very stuck in his baby step ways. He's very stuck in who he is. He will not evolve because that's the way he makes millions and millions of dollars. And that's just not the way that money is. Money is supposed to evolve with you. It's supposed to work for your life. You're not supposed to feel like shit about everything that you buy. And it's really taken me a long time to teach myself to not feel shame around money. No matter what area I am in in life, no matter what net worth I have, no matter where I'm at, it took me a long time. I always, I tell this story a couple of years ago, I was in a store and I was having a panic attack over buying a $70 vest because I was like, you know, this is not in the budget. Like, I don't know. What am I going to do? And Joe was like, my husband was like, what? What's wrong with you? And I texted my best friend, Sammy, Sammy Womack, a sunny side of life. I have to t- talk about her in every podcast interview I do. So there it is. I texted her and I was like, like, I'm having like a panic attack over buying this jacket. And she was like, girl, that's trauma. That's like Dave Ramsey trauma. I'm like, yeah, it really is. Oh my God. So it turned into something bigger than I thought it was going to. And I just finally looked up and I was like coming out of a fog. It's like, wow, like, I really feel like the shame and guilt and the way he talks to people, the way he talked to me, you know, like, I was just like, nah, <laughs> this is not a vibe. <laughs> no, I am not about this. No. So let's talk about your debt payoff journey. So you were able to pay off $71,000 in five years. Talk us through that because that's an amazing accomplishment. Well, thank you. Yeah. Basically, I used my entire paycheck to pay off our debt. I didn't get a paycheck for two years. And my first husband was a sheriff's deputy and he had a lot of overtime. And so we used all of that money. Plus, I worked side hustles and I really, we worked to the bone to pay that off. And in some ways I regret it because there was absolutely no balance. And when I say I was obsessed with money and Dave Ramsey, I truly mean I was obsessed with it. Like I woke up and I thought about it. I went to bed and I thought about it. That was the only thing that I care about. 
And I definitely think that contributed to the ending of our marriage. Um, and I've been through a lot of therapy to be able to like actually say this. <laughs> um, but yeah, I learned a lot. You know, I learned about balance. I learned about being obsessed with something to an unhealthy, toxic degree. And I learned that really, if you want more permanent results, that's really not the way to go. And I've talked to so many people that really go hard like that. And then they just regress because it's like a crash diet. And you end up developing other coping mechanisms for shit in your life, or you end up just going back to what you used to be doing and you've made no progress. But essentially, yeah, I mean, I just started budgeting. I started working, putting extra money towards debt. And that's how I did it. I And for five years, I really, even when I decided to not follow Dave Ramsey, that's what I did. I just realized, you know, this is a way of life and I really don't want to be in debt. It's just not for me personally. I don't like it. And I think that not being in debt, especially as somebody who deals with mental health disorder, is something that has really benefited me and my peace in my life. And so that's why I really was super passionate about just getting out of it. Even when I wasn't following Dave Ramsey, I was like, I just can't handle this over my head looming. So yeah, 71,000 in five years. <laughs> That's an incredible sacrifice for you to make. So, you know, I think it's important for folks to know that like, that's not an easy decision to make. Another thing too, I think is like this idea that debt payoff has to be something that we accept as part of our normal lives forever. And it's not right. Like we can make conscious decisions to use it to our benefit, but then also do the things that we need to do to not let it be the thing that stops us from living our lives. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I talk about this a lot is like, I just never even knew that this lifestyle was possible. It just was never even presented to me as an option. I grew up with the month, the money narrative, you know, you're always going to struggle. You're always going to be in debt. If you get out of debt, you're going to get back into debt. And that was, you know, a result of my parents own trauma and their own shit around money. But I realized I can make that change. I can be that change. I don't have to just accept this. And so when I found other people online that were doing this successfully, it was just a light bulb moment. And I realized like, I don't have to struggle with money. And I mean, I really did grow up with my family, my mom and dad just fighting constantly about money. And I just did not want that in my life. So yeah, I think once you realize like it's an, even an option, once people realize like, oh, like that doesn't have to be my life, it really changes the game. Because then you have a motivation that you didn't have before and you have an education that you didn't have before. And I think really just educating people on the option of not doing that is so important. So let's talk about what personal finance gets wrong now, because now you're on the other side, you're educating folks, you are using your voice to make this a more inclusive space. What do you want to see more of in the personal finance conversation? Yeah, I want to see more of a realistic representation of income. That's something that is really important to me. You know, I see a bunch of influencers or influencers say, you know, I made $800,000 in a year, but they don't talk about taxes or any of what it's like to actually run a business. It's just like these grandiose income statements, which I'm not a fan of because it just doesn't give a realistic view of an average everyday American. I can't remember the exact statistic, so don't quote me 100% on this. But it's like most Americans don't make $50,000 a year. Like that's just the reality. So my page really tries to focus on like, okay, so you're not like going to be a millionaire. You're not going to invest $500 a month to become a millionaire. So what can you do in your situation now? Like I want realistic advice. And I think that's something that it's not flashy. It's not something that's going to get you a ton of followers like overnight. And so that's why I think the conversation needs to change and we need to have more people that operate in that kind of mindset. And it's not from a lack mindset. It's just from shit is hard. <laughs> like Not everybody's going to be rich. Not everybody's going to be able to invest that amount of money. So what can we do now to make your life a little bit better? And to maybe get you thinking about ways that you can increase your income, that you can maybe get out of a situation that you're in. Another thing that I would love to see personal finance people talk about, and I have been seeing it more and more, which is great, just because of the inclusion that's been happening the last couple of years, which thank God, it's just women and divorce, women and abuse, women and financial abuse, and how 
money is used as a means of control manipulation. I think that's really important to talk about. And then just the personal finance is personal. Like we shouldn't feel shame and guilt around money. We should learn how to make it work for ourselves and our life. Not the way it looks like for some old millionaire in Tennessee. Right. You know, it's funny. I always say Dave Ramsey does not practice what he preaches because he gives folks financial advice for like usually the working class, right? For people who have a nine to five job, but he's not doing the nine to five thing. He became a fucking millionaire because of a business. So I'm like, sir, you're literally living in a completely opposite life of the people who you claim to help. And it's just like, why? Why, sir? Yeah. We need answers. <laughs> yeah, he won't give it to you. He, he makes too much money. To yeah, care. exactly. So yeah. let's talk about your journey as an entrepreneur. So now you have a digital marketing firm. But what I also love is that you also talk about the fact that even though you're a business owner, you still side hustle doing other things. So tell me about your journey as an entrepreneur and why you still side hustle. I still side hustle because I personally believe that one source of income is too close to zero sources of income. I started my business in 2019 and then the pandemic happened and I lost half of my clients in that amazing March week where the stock market completely just crashed and everybody was like, holy shit, this is real. So I lost half my clients and I was just sitting there like, well, this was a great time to start a business. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, I've always done Rover and I did Rover, which is dog sitting. I did that while I was getting my business started just to supplement my income because I don't know if people know this, but you're not just an overnight success. I know a lot of people like to claim that, but you're not. I think one of my first invoices I ever sent was for $7. That's a real story. Like I sent that invoice for $7. So I was just trying really hard to like get my shit together, get going. And so I did Rover in Ohio is when I really started it. And it did really well for me. It allowed me to pay rent and to eat and to live my life while I was trying to build a business from ground zero. So I like that security that comes with that because in entrepreneurship, there really is no security. One month can be really great. Another month can be terrible. You just never really know. At least you don't know until you get way further into it. So that's why I really liked Rover. And I am also this person that's either going 100 miles an hour or I'm napping. There's just no in between. I contribute that to my anxiety. So I just always have to stay busy. And also just living in a high cost of living area. I live in Boulder, Colorado. Our rent is $2,000 a month minimum. So it's just really fucking expensive to live out here. Those are the three main reasons why I continue to side hustle and I really like the entrepreneurship life gives me freedom to work in very different fields. Like I'm a professional dog sitter and walker. I'm also a professional digital marketing agency. I also really love to make soap and I love that I can switch it up. And because working a nine to five office job, like I would literally just like beat my head against the wall if I had to do that. I just can't do it. I like the variety. I think you and I are very similar in that respect. Like I feel, especially when you talk about your mental health, anxiety, just the way that our brains operate. I think a lot of folks can see, especially if you're high functioning anxiety, which I assume you do because I know I do, it can feel like, oh, you know, you're always just killing it. Like you're always working on something. You're always doing something. But y'all, like a lot of the times that is a coping mechanism because we just don't want to be alone with our thoughts. And so you talk a lot about mental health and finances. Can you tell me more about how your journey with your mental health has been impacted by your money and how you've reformed that relationship as time goes on? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I've already mentioned this previously. Growing up, there were a lot of fights and turmoil in my house about money. And I remember very distinctly, I think it was 15 or 16, don't remember my age, but I remember our car being repossessed. And I remember my dad pawning silver every single month like clockwork just to get by. And so growing up, we looked middle class. We looked like we were doing fine, but in reality, it was very unstable. And so I think that definitely contributed to my internal money narrative and to my anxiety when it comes to basic stuff like transportation. And so I really took that and I started educating myself. And the more educated I became, the more stable I felt 
Because I was like, okay, like I'm armed with this knowledge and I will never be like that. So it kind of gave me some peace. And now when I budget, I don't have anxiety surrounding it because I know what I'm doing. And everybody listening to know, like I didn't know what I was doing in the very beginning. And it wasn't like all rainbows and butterflies. Um, But still just going through the act of budgeting really helped me feel like I was in control. And it made me feel like I do know what's going to happen at the end of the month. So I don't have to ruminate on it. And so really budgeting and financial education calmed my mental health down when it came to money. And now it's more of like, okay, I have anxiety of like not saving enough for a vacation in the amount of time that I want to. or And that's totally self-imposed. It's a very different feeling when you're in control versus when you feel like everything is out of your control. But yeah, I mean, mental health has a huge impact on the way that people manage their money. And I do try to talk about that and my own journey. And what works for me isn't necessarily going to work for somebody else. But I do feel like having the control over my money and being financially educated is something that's helped me for sure. I'd love to know how your journey with budgeting has changed since when you were Dave Ramsey member versus now. How has it evolved? You know, I used to be a very ardent budgeter. I used to look at it every day. I used to budget to the dollar, to the penny, really. Especially when I was paying off debt, I was just so obsessed. I was like, I have to know where everything's going. Now I'm much more relaxed. Like I know my numbers, like I know what's coming in, what's going out. I know around about all of our bills, but I'm much more like flexible when it comes to spending money or spending money on experiences, doing things. I'm not going to be like, well, we'll go a little over budget. So we're not going to do it. Like we have money. We have savings account. We have an extra savings account buffer. Like we have various fail safes in our world. So it's not we're living paycheck to paycheck anymore. So it's more loose than it used to be, I would say. I think it's good to give yourself permission to evolve, right? We are humans. And so your budget should also evolve as you grow and learn. So I love that. Okay. Let's talk about, you are open about divorce. And I think the topic around divorce and how it impacts women, I don't think has had enough in our conversation. So what would you say to women right now who may be on the cusp of divorce or are going through it? Like what should they be doing to shore up their finances and prevent this from becoming like something that follows them for years to come? Yeah, that's a really hard conversation, especially right now with the economy the way it is. I would say if you are going to get a divorce, I would get an FU fund immediately. Start saving money, start protecting yourself. Because once you do cross that bridge, you are no longer being a nice person. This is a contractual agreement that you are breaking. It is almost like a business agreement. So you have to go in there thinking like that and protecting yourself, especially if you have children. I was very, very lucky. I do not have any children. I didn't with my first husband. So uh, we only had the house. That was the only thing that we quote unquote fought over. But yeah, that would be my first thing is start to protect your assets, start moving money to an account that is just for you. I was in a very privileged stance when I got divorced. My entire family rallied around me. I stayed with my parents rent free for four months, anything free. They paid for everything because all of my money went to my lawyer. Every single dime that I had left over went to my lawyer. So if you have the ability and if you have a community, reach out. Don't be um, ashamed to reach out to people that are in your vicinity that can help you and just make sure that you are trying to protect yourself. And I know it's extremely emotional, but My therapist, when I was going through it, told me you have to think about it as a business deal when you go into that attorney's office. Don't fall into the trap of being nice because I have seen so many women try to be nice and try to do it the kind way and then they get really fucked over or their ex-spouse decides to do something and they're like, I couldn't see this coming. So go in there thinking like a shark. Seriously. I mean, I know that's really harsh, but it's the truth. No, I appreciate the honesty. And I'm curious how you approached your second marriage from a financial standpoint, knowing what you knew from how things went with the first. Well, my first husband was a piece of shit and he was very abusive and manipulative. And I've talked about that in national press. So it's not something that is a surprise to most people that I you know, talk to. And I went through a lot of therapy to understand if anybody can take anything away from this interview, it's go to therapy. <laughs> 
<laughs> because therapy is the shit. I mean, it'll make you realize so many things about yourself and it'll absolutely rewire things in your head and allow you to break patterns that you wouldn't normally be able to break. And so therapy allowed me to break a pattern of who I allowed into my heart and it allowed me to see red flags. I got married to my ex after four months of knowing him. So (laughs) that happened. And I was very young and dumb. And I just, my brain was just not evolved. And so (laughs) when I met Joe, my second husband, he was just a very different man than my first husband. And so his ideas around money weren't mine versus yours. And I think that was a huge shift for me. He was like, no, this is ours. And that was very, very different because my first husband was when I left and I took money out of the account to survive, he said, you're stealing money. So that's the kind of different narratives that they both had around money. Very different. I knew that Joe was a very different person than my first husband and I could trust him. And I think when you get out of a divorce, when you become single and you're thinking about becoming serious with somebody else, you know, being open about what you've gone through is number one. I was very open with Joe about my past and about my reservations about sharing money again. And what would this look like? What would that look like? And just being honest about that with your future spouse or your serious real partner. It was a struggle in the beginning. It was very, very difficult. But I think after conversations, I felt more comfortable with it. So you don't have to combine finances for your relationship to be valid. Do what works for you. There is no roadmap to this. People are going to tell you, well, you're not in a real relationship or your marriage is is broken if you do this. And that's bullshit. I know people that have never combined finances after 12 years. I know people that have been divorced and have combined finances. And I know people that do a hybrid version. It's whatever works for you and your relationship. (laughs) This is why they say personal finance is personal. So for folks who are at the beginning of their financial journey and are overwhelmed with where to start, what advice would you give them as far as like one thing they can do today to get started on a path to better financial health? Yeah. I mean, the first thing that I always tell people to do, always start with an emergency fund. I just don't think that you should be doing anything in personal finance unless you have a buffer to life because life's going to fuck you up no matter what. I mean, the first two years of my debt payoff journey, like I was getting separated (laughs) and I only had a thousand dollars because at the time I was following Dave Ramsey. I drained that thousand dollars. I actually had to borrow money from family to pay for my attorney. So always start with your emergency fund. That is going to be forever my piece of advice that personal finance is personal, except for have an emergency fund because you need some form of liquid cash to take care of yourself in an emergency. And you don't want to run your emergency up on a really high interest credit card that'll end up just screwing you over with that payment later on. You want to be able to take care of an emergency without having to worry about the money aspect of it later. So I always say start with one month at least in an emergency fund in a high yield savings account. I use Ally. I'm pretty sure most people in the personal finance industry use Ally or Capital 360. It's either one of the two. That's my first piece of advice. And it really is like something digestible that you can do while you're learning more about personal finance. So make a plan to get one month's expenses saved up. And then after that, take it day by day. What can you change in your life? What can you cut that you don't need anymore or that you don't find joy anymore? So I usually say emergency fund and then negotiate your really boring bills. Like no one wants to pay a lot of money for car insurance. Like that's boring. And you probably don't get any joy out of that. So try to negotiate those bills and reduce your spending on things that you don't really give a shit about so that you can spend more money on what you do care about. And you can start building your wealth in that way. I love the value-based spending approach. I think it's something that changed my life when I realized that, oh, so these things that people told me I should care about, like buying a house or driving an expensive car, this is actually optional. Oh, okay, cool. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. (laughs) It's crazy when you know options, like your whole world opens up. Absolutely. V, this has been an incredible conversation. I want folks to find out so much more about you. So tell us where we can find you and what you are working on. So you can find me at at V-E-E Frugal Fox on Instagram and Twitter. I hang out over there usually. My website is vfrugalfox.com. 
Uh, I'm currently working on, I'm a co-host on the Price of Avocado Toast podcast. So I do some episodes over there and pretty much what I've been doing. So (laughs) please come follow me. There are a lot of fun conversations that we have over there laced with cursing and some harsh realities of life. So (laughs) I'm here for it and I love it. So thank you so much for being here. Yeah, of course. Thank you for having me.